Hi, everyone. My name is Lori Peek. I'm a professor of sociology and the director of the Natural Hazard Center here at the University of Colorado Boulder. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the Making Mitigation Work webinar series, which is hosted by the Natural Hazard Center and made possible with the support of the Federal Emergency Management Agency and the National Science Foundation. This webinar series highlights recent progress in mitigation policy, practice, and research. We are so grateful that you have joined us today. Before we begin the webinar presentation, please know that this forum is being recorded. The captioned webinar video and the presentation slides will be posted online at the Natural Hazard Center website, which is hazards.colorado.edu. This is also where you can find the recordings and supplemental materials from the prior Making Mitigation Work webinars, as well as from today's session. We also wanted to notify all participants that thanks to a partnership with the International Association of Emergency Managers, we are now offering one contact hour of emergency management training through the IAEM certification program. To receive the credit, you are required to attend for the entire webinar session. Please visit the Making Mitigation Work webpage under the Trainings tab at hazards.colorado.edu for more information. You can also contact Katie Murphy for more information on receiving your certificate for attending the webinar today. Katie's email address is on the current slide and the Making Mitigation Work webpage. If at any point during the presentation you have questions or comments, you can offer those either via the chat function or the Q&A box on Zoom. You can set the chat function so only the presenter and the administrator see your comments or so everyone on the webinar sees them. Our speaker will respond to questions as time permits during the webinar. For those questions we are unable to get to, we will share written responses via the Making Mitigation Work webinar page. Now, without further ado, I would like to introduce, introduce you to our speaker for today's webinar. Sarah Grineski is Professor of Sociology and Co-Director of the Center for Natural and Technological Hazards at the University of Utah. I have known Sarah for quite some time now. I first met her when she was an assistant professor and a participant in the National Science Foundation Enabling Fellows Program, which is all about mentoring and training a next generation of researchers. Sarah stood out in that program, and over the years, she has produced an extensive body of important research on children and environmental hazards, technological hazards and disasters. Back in August, I heard her present some additional recent research on the vital role of mitigation in shaping mental health outcomes following Hurricane Harvey. I beelined for her after her session ended and asked her to please join us during this webinar series. She graciously accepted that invitation and now we will all have the opportunity to learn from her. Sarah, thank you so much for accepting the invitation and for joining us today. We are going to go ahead and turn the slide presentation capabilities over to you now. As we do that, I hope our webinar participants will join in offering a warm virtual welcome to you. Over to you, Sarah. Thank you so much, Lori, for that very kind introduction. We are just uh, setting up the slides here. Um, is that working? Do you see our slides? Great, Sarah, thank you. Excellent. So I'm here with uh, one of my graduate students, Erin Flores, and we are gonna talk about how mitigation helped Houston households in Hurricane Harvey. And I have a, a slight cold, so excuse the scratchiness of my voice. So uh, as Lori said, uh, she already introduced me with that very kind introduction, so I'll let Aaron introduce himself. Hello, my name is Aaron. I'm a doctoral student in the Department of Geography at the University of Utah. I'm also a research assistant for the Center of Natural and Technological Hazards. Great, and so what we're gonna do today is Erin is going to introduce you to some background on Hurricane Harvey and some of our team's research uh, on social vulnerability and Hurricane Harvey. And then I'm gonna talk about the specific analysis that Lori mentioned 
about mitigation and the positive benefits that we found after Harvey that extend well beyond uh, just uh, less damages to your household. Okay, so I'll get us started with um, Hurricane Harvey in Greater Houston. So Greater Houston is the second largest metropolitan area in, te in the, um, Texas after Dallas-Fort Worth region and the fifth largest in the United States. The region is vulnerable to tropical storms and hurricanes that crisscross the Gulf of Mexico. Um, in 2001, Tropical Storm Allison killed 22 people, damaged thousands of homes, and caused widespread flooding. Houston has since been affected by Hurricanes Rita and Katrina in 2005, Ike in 2008, and of course, Hurricane Harvey in 2017. Hurricane Harvey came ashore near Rockport, Texas on the 25th of August, 2017. It was a category four storm with winds in excess of 200 kilometers per hour. The storm lingered over land for an extended period of time due to a combination due to a combination of meteorological factors, including warm water over the Gulf of Mexico and a lack of wind in the upper atmosphere. It caused an extreme storm surge and unprecedented rainfall totals. In the six day period following landfall, large portions of Southeast Texas received over one meter of rain. Among the 13 million people directly affected by the storm, 22,000 were rescued from floodwaters 32,000 were temporarily housed in shelters, and at least 450,000 people applied for disaster assistance from FEMA. Only 17% of those impacted had flood insurance. Harvey and subsequent flooding caused da severe damage in the nine county, greater Houston metropolitan area, which is the focus of the current study. Creeks and bayous in the metropolitan area reached water levels that have never been reached before. A record setting 76 centimeters of rain fell in parts of the Houston area. Over 156,000 homes were destroyed and at least 39 people died. Most of the flooding receded within two days, but some areas remained flooded for weeks. So this is an animation of Hurricane Harvey over several days. Um, and so hurricanes are often associated with their wind speed and their wind damages um, but in the case of Harvey, because it stalled over the Houston area for so long, um, it dropped um, torrential amounts of rain. And so this animation is a blend of visible and infrared imagery captured by the GOES-16 satellite that was developed by NOAA. So here's the uh, Greater Houston study area. This shows um, the nine counties in the Greater Houston area. Um, Harris County is by far the largest county in the study area, which contains the city of Houston. The flooded area indicated by the light blue color depicts a three meter by three meter resolution raster grid that's referred to as the Harvey's inundation footprint. This cartographic product was prepared by FEMA's Region 6 Mitigation Division and is used in our analysis. So unlike the vast majority of other post-disaster studies which involve convenience sampling, our study participants were initially randomly selected using a probability-based design for a survey about social vulnerability to flood hazards in the summer of 2012. Our follow-up with some of the same set of respondents within 90 days of Harvey enables a pre- and post-event study design, which is uncommon to research on disasters. When respondents are surveyed only after a disaster, reported outcomes are usually more severe than when pre-disaster respondents are resurveyed. This is because those surveyed after a disaster are usually those more severely impacted than the average person from whom the baseline data existed. Previous research uh, project under, oh, sorry. So due to the challenging logistics of conducting social science research on disasters, the more commonly employed after only study designs usually survey people at shelters and community centers who have been most affected and may have the fewest resources to respond. There's also limited research that has examined the unintended consequences and broad based benefits of home site hazard mitigation and disaster preparedness. Our pre, pre and post event design study uniquely enables an examination of how preparations 
taken in the years before Harvey translates into outcomes post-disaster. So other studies have examined unanticipated consequences related to other hurricane phenomena. For example, how having flooded insurance may have undermined homeowners' financial incentive to protect against hurricane damage using structural mitigation actions, and how the levee system in New Orleans gave residents a false sense of security, which translated into delayed evacuation during Katrina. But they have not examined multifaceted post-event consequences of home site mitigation or disaster preparedness. So research on Harvey is still limited, but our team has done some research on this. So to um, give you some background, some of the studies we've done, um, our colleague Tim Collins led a study um, and with Sarah, our colleague Jay, and myself. And this project is based on a sample of 377 Greater Houston households that completed a 2012 survey and still resided in the same home at the time of Hurricane Harvey. The objectives of the study were to measure residential exposure to flooding, residential decision making, property flood mitigation, and flood risk perception from Harvey. The study integrated Harvey's inundation footprint, which you saw before, and um, it was developed by FEMA's Region 6 division, with sur and we integrated survey data collected from the 377 households. Statistical analyses were based on multivariate generalized estimating equations, or GEEs. We found that Hispanic, Black, and other racial and ethnic minority households experienced more extensive flooding than white households, and lower socioeconomic households faced more extensive flooding than higher socioeconomic households. And this study has been published in environmental research. A second study that was led by our colleague Jay also utilized the Harvey's inundation footprint to assess the environmental justice implications of flooding from Harvey in Greater Houston. We analyzed whether the extent of flooding was distributed inequitably with respect to race, ethnicity, and socioeconomic status. Um, like I mentioned, the study integrated Harvey's inundation footprint, and we also integrated socio demographic data from the 2012-2016 American Community Survey. Statistical analyses were based on bivariate correlations and multivariate GEEs, like in the previous study. Results indicate that um, Harvey-induced flooding was significantly greater in neighborhoods with higher proportions of non-Hispanic Blacks and socioeconomically deprived residents after controlling for other contextual factors and clustering. This study has been published in the American Journal of Public Health. Um, another study that we have conducted and is currently under review um, looks at the health effects from Hurricane Harvey. Um, this study, we were interested in the mental and physical health impacts and also constrained access to healthcare post Harvey. We utilized the 2017 survey data from 403 households in Greater Houston. We measured various physical health problems associated with Harvey, but the most common were allergies or hay fever, headaches, nose irritation, and throat irritation. We found that over half of the respondents experienced at least 20, one of the 24 physical health problems, and 11% of respondents experienced 10 or more of these physical health problems. The most common symptom associated with post-traumatic stress was having repeated disturbing memories, thoughts, or images of Hurricane Harvey, which is experienced by nearly half of the sample. We measured post-traumatic stress using the Post-Traumatic Stress Disorder Checklist, or PCL-S, which is a 17-item self-reported measure, including questions about specific experiences occurring anytime since Hurricane Harvey. To learn more about this measure and the physical health problems, please feel free to contact me for a copy of the manuscript. Um, to continue on the study, 22% of respondents reported going out, going without access to healthcare during or soon after Harvey. Um, using multivariate regression models, we found that physical health problems disproportionately affected people who did not evacuate. Post-traumatic stress had disparate impacts on African-Americans, 
those experiencing post-Harvey unemployment and older people. And then lastly, healthcare access was constrained for people experiencing unemployment and those with disabilities. In a second study that was led by me, we used the same 2017 survey data, but this time we included 439 respondents. Uh, this study is focused on unmet needs after Harvey, and unlike most needs assessments conducted in the US, this study examines social vulnerability indicators as determinants of unmet needs. Unmet needs are things like going without electricity, inadequate drinking water, transportation, food, bathroom access, or no hot water. We asked a total of 11 questions related to unmet needs. Study participants experienced an average of three unmet needs and 70% experienced at least one. Going without electricity, lacking money for living expenses, and adequate transportation were the most common. Multivariate analysis indicates that non-Hispanic Blacks, US-born Hispanics, foreign-born Hispanics with citizenship, and foreign-born Hispanics without citizenship had significantly more unmet needs compared to non-Hispanic whites. Lower socioeconomic status was also associated with increased unmet needs. This paper has recently been accepted in the International Journal of Disaster Risk Reduction. And lastly, um, a study that's currently underway by one of our undergraduate researchers, Angel Griego, is focused on the receipt of assistance after Harvey. Um, we found that US-born Hispanics were more likely more likely than non-Hispanic whites to receive post-Harvey assistance from any source. And we found that receiving assistance was not associated with complete household recovery, but less home damage, fewer post-traumatic stress symptoms, and higher income were associated with more complete near-term recovery. So results of these studies provide evidence of racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic injustices in the distribution of flooding associated with Hurricane Harvey. Also, we find evidence of disparities in physical and mental health impacts in unmet needs and unequal recovery associated with Harvey. Results represent an important starting point for more detailed investigation of disproportionate impacts associated with Hurricane Harvey. All right, so thank you, Erin, for introducing the study and also some of the other research our team has been doing focused on Harvey. But what we're going to focus on specifically today for the rest of this presentation is how baseline preparedness and mitigation are related to post-Harvey health effects, event exposures, and recovery. And with the, what Erin was presenting to you, those last couple slides about our research, used a, a sample of respondents who we surveyed in 2017. It turns out that based on the design of our study, 71 of those respondents also participated in a 2012 project. So in 2012, we had conducted some research on flood uh, vulnerability in the greater Houston area. And then when Harvey hit in 2017, our team got to thinking about those respondents. I wonder what happened to them. I wonder how they're doing. And so we decided to investigate uh, their experiences after Harvey. And this project specifically that I'm going to present to you now works with those, those data specifically. So it turned out to be harder than we thought it would be to try to follow up with our respondents uh, from 2012. In 2012, we had done a survey, a probability-based random sample of 600 greater Houston area residents. So after Harvey hit, we worked with a marketing firm that specializes in sampling. We excluded respondents no longer residing permanently in the study area as of August 25th, and those who said back in 2012 that we could not contact them again for follow-up studies. Then the marketing research firm we were working with used current address information to update the phone numbers for the remaining Greater Houston households. So we had 484 households who had consented to follow-up and were still residing in Houston as of Hurricane Harvey. So we had updated phone numbers, and that included landline as well as cellular numbers. We knew that cell numbers were very important to this wave of data collection since they allowed us to make contact with people who had relocated either temporarily or permanently in the months following Harvey. 
We also, from the marketing firm, uh, appended email addresses for this response, for each respondent. And we also had some email addresses which we had collected back in 2012. So then through a partnership with a survey research firm, the same firm we'd actually used in 2012, uh, they contacted the 484 respondents via email if it was available, and then via landline and then via cell phone. The multimodal approach that we used helped to increase response rates and are appropriate when trying to find respondents after disasters. The respondents could take the survey online or by phone in either English or Spanish. And of the 484 households in the sampling frame that we had to begin with, we reached or made contact with 125 of those uh, households and 71 consented to participate. So the research I'm gonna to present to you moving forward is specifically these 71 households that we had survey data from at two points in time. So here's a list of the variables that we used in the study. I'll go through each of them in greater detail. Uh, for pre-event preparedness, we had asked respondents back in 2012 if they had taken six preparedness measures. And so I'll show you the specific measures here in a moment. In 2012, we also asked respondents if their household was protected in terms of seven different home site flood hazard mitigation actions, either because their household or a separate property owner or manager had taken the action or the action had already been done when they moved in. So I'll show you those specific items here in a moment. We also consider some social vulnerability variables. So looking at respondents who are of older age, in this case defined as age 74 or older. We also looked at whether respondents were from a racial ethnic minority background. We just used a person of color versus non-Hispanic white due to small counts in this sample. We also collected information about each household's pre-tax annual income in 2017 using the same item that the US decennial census uses. And then we also, in our multivariate model, use some control variables that are uh, related to our outcomes, but not the variables we're specifically interested in. And that includes flood insurance. And we asked about if your home or the contents were covered by the National Flood Insurance Program. We also use that Harvey inundation footprint that Aaron has mentioned several times already to calculate the average flood depth within 100 meters of each home of these responses. And then in terms of our outcomes, we were interested in how preparedness and mitigation in 2012 relate to physical health effects, uh, post-traumatic stress, using the same checklist that Aaron already mentioned to you. We were also interested in if those variables related to the adverse event experiences which are 25 different experiences that happened to our respondents during or soon after Harvey, and I'll show you that list in a moment. We were interested in the outcome of home damage. Was the home completely destroyed, seriously damaged, all the way up to not damaged at all? And then we were interested in recovery. To what extent has your household recovered on a scale of one to 10? And also, did you receive any benefits? from Hurricane Harvey. We asked respondents if they had benefited in eight specific ways, which I'll show you in a moment, because of their experiences with Harvey. And these items were derived from a post-traumatic growth inventory that has been used in other research. And also it's worth noting that 11 of our 71 households actually moved between 2012 and 2017, but they moved to a greater Houston address and so for those households, we asked them questions about the preparedness and the mitigation of the home before Harvey, um, because they weren't living in the same home, so it didn't make any sense to use the 2012 data there. So what I'm going to present to you next are some answers to these research questions. The first set of research questions describe the sample, and then the seventh research question uses a multivariate model to isolate the effects of preparedness and mitigation on our outcomes, which include health effects, event exposures, and recovery. So to make this session a little bit interactive, we uh, have a poll for you. So we would like you to consider this list of pre-event emergency preparedness actions. These are the list of questions that we gave to our respondents. And we are wondering uh, which one you think is the most common. 
Hey, Sarah, this is Lori. And since we have some um, call in participants who we know if they're not on the Zoom webinar yeah. app, they can't participate. But uh, since they're listening in, would you be willing while people are completing the poll to go ahead and read off the question and the responses? Thank you. Yes, definitely. So our poll question for those of you listening by phone is consider this list of general pre-event emergency preparedness action. Which action was the most common amongst our sample and which action was the least common? And the measures that we included are developed and practice an evacuation plan with all household members, learned about your community's emergency plans, warning signals, evacuation routes, and locations of emergency shelters and medical emergency centers nearest you, trained at least one household member in first aid and CPR, learned how to turn off your current home's electrical power at the main switch and how to turn off the gas and water supplies of the valves, purchased a fire extinguisher and made sure that members of your household know where it is and how to use it, and lastly created and maintained an easy to carry emergency kit for use at home or during evacuation that is stocked with supplies such as a flashlight, first aid kit, and water. So in terms of the poll, how do we see the responses? Sarah, would you like us to go ahead and read off the responses? Sure, why don't you just tell us what people think is the most common and what do you think is the least common? Okay, so right now in terms of, uh, we had about a 50% response rate from our webinar participants. <laughs> and in terms of the answer to which one did they think was the um, least common among, or the most common among the sample, excuse me, what the most common was, uh, 45% of the respondents said they thought it was created and maintained an easy to carry emergency kit for use at home or during evacuation that is stocked with supplies such as a flashlight, first aid kit, and water. And then for which was the least common, about 38% um, of our respondents uh, said that trained at least one member of the household in first aid. They thought that was the least common action taken. Thanks, Sarah. This is great. Okay, so let's keep going. So what did we find? We found that the most common amongst this sample was actually learning how to turn off your home's electrical power at the main switch. And interestingly, the least common was trained at least one household member in first aid and CPR. Although what you can notice from these descriptive statistics of our sample is that in general, uh, the vast majority, the majority of these households were relatively well prepared, right? With over 66% doing each of those things and up to 87% learning how to turn off the home's electrical power at the main street. So we're going, I promise, I only have three polls in the talk for those of you that find this a bit tedious. But our next poll is specifically related to the pre-event mitigation actions. And here, and I'll read it to you in a moment, is the list of mitigation actions that uh, people could take. And this was data we collected from the 2012 survey. We asked about if interior drainage system had been installed, including a sump up with backup power. We asked if the home structure was originally built or later elevated above flood height. We asked if the electrical components of the home and the home's water heater, furnace, washer, and dryer were all installed above flood height. We asked if the home's indoor HVAC system components were installed above flood height. We asked if the outdoor service equipment like the air conditioner, the heat pump, electric and gas meters, and fuel tanks were anchored above flood height. We asked if they had flood walls, berms, or levees built on site to protect the home. We asked if they had hurricane shutters, and we asked if they had a reinforced roof to protect against strong winds by installing, for example, by installing hurricane straps or clips. 
And so these uh, items, which we're asking you now, which do you think was the most common and which do you think was the least common, these items, we actually summed them up and we used those then to examine how they related to the outcomes that we were interested in. But we were also interested in just the descriptive statistics in terms of how common these mitigation actions are amongst a sample of Houston, greater Houston residents. So let's see the results, Lori. So we're giving just a, a little bit more time to vote, Sarah. It looks like about half of the webinar participants have voted so far. Um, okay, so we're going to close the poll in about 10 seconds. Okay, so the survey shows that in terms of the pre-event mitigation actions, the one that uh, our webinar participants thought was most common, about 35% said having hurricane shutters. And then in terms of which one was the least common, about a quarter of our webinar participants who responded said have flood walls, berms, or levees built on site to protect the home. Thank you. So the actually the mitigation, let's see if I can, I'm trying to advance my slide here. There we go. Interestingly, the hurricane shutters was the least common, although the flood walls were not that common either. Uh, the most common mitigation measure that these Houston households had taken were home indoor HVAC systems being elevated above flood height, and the majority of the respondents had those systems installed above. So in terms of the physical health symptoms of these 71 respondents, this was obviously 2017 data, allergies or hay fever is the most common. And all the items here in the list affected over 5% of the sample. And these are the items that we summed up to create our physical health sum, which we'll use in our statistical model. This table shows the percentages of the residents that were affected moderately quite a bit or very much by these different symptoms of post-traumatic stress. This is not included in the table here, but one third of respondents reported having none of the PTS symptoms, and the rest had experienced at least one of the symptoms a little bit of the time. The most common symptoms were repeated disturbing memories, thoughts, or images of Harvey, with nearly one third reporting that this affected them moderately quite a bit or very much. Feeling upset when reminded of Harvey and being super alert or on guard affected just under one quarter of the respondents. 13% of the respondents had a score on the PTSD scale of over 33, suggesting that they may meet a threshold for potential PTS. In terms of those adverse event experiences that I was talking about, three quarters of respondents worried about family members or close friends suffering during the disaster, as you can see in the table. The second most common experience was being present when major flooding or hurricane damage occurred. The next two were being worried about crime and going without electricity. One quarter to one fifth of respondents went without adequate transportation and smelled unpleasant chemical odors. The table shows those unmet needs that had affected at least 15% of respondents. While the home damage uh, result is not included in, in a table, I'll tell you that 43% of respondents in our study here experienced no home damage, and 7% suffered major damage, including one whose home was completely destroyed. In terms of recovery, hazards like Hurricane Harvey can introduce challenge, challenges, but it's also the case that experiencing stressors during and after a disaster can be associated with post-traumatic growth, perceived benefits, and what are colloquially called silver linings. For example, after Hurricane Katrina, people said that becoming better prepared for future events and seeing an increase in Good Samaritan Acts were silver linings that people experienced after Hurricane Katrina. 
After Hurricane Harvey, amongst this sample of 71, we found that half the respondents reported that Harvey had brought their family members and their friends closer together. And 40% had become more optimistic and developed better uh, relationships with the neighbors. You can see that barely anyone had financial benefits in terms of a greater income or a better job, but that they had these social benefits of experiencing Hurricane Harvey, which are indicative of post-traumatic growth. So this is the last and final poll, and it relates to our a multivariate model where we're looking specifically at mitigation and how that was related to these outcomes after Harvey. So for those of you listening by phone, the poll is higher levels of pre-event mitigation were significantly, in a statistical sense, associated with which of the following? Fewer numbers of physical health problems, fewer post-traumatic stress symptoms, fewer numbers of adverse Harvey-associated event experiences, less home damage, greater near-term recovery, and greater benefits in terms of post-traumatic. And I guess I should tell you, I didn't tell you this a moment ago, in terms of near-term recovery, 61% of the households had reported that their household had recovered completely within the three months after Harvey. 25% uh, rated their household on between a one and a six, um, and one is not at all recovered. So I guess in terms of the poll, let us know what you think we found in our multivariate analysis, and then we'll let you know what that was. And Sarah, the votes are still coming in, so we'll give it about 15 more seconds, then we'll share the results. That sounds great. Yeah, thanks for embedding these questions throughout. Okay, so the poll shows uh, in terms of our webinar participants who voted, the question was again, higher levels of pre-event mitigation were significantly associated with which of the following? And uh, this is definitely a, a tight race here. About 22% of the respondents said greater near-term recovery, but then 21% said less home damage, 19 percent said fewer numbers of adverse Harvey associated events and then 18 percent said fewer post-traumatic stress symptoms with fewer saying greater benefits in terms of post-traumatic growth or fewer numbers of physical mm -hmm. health problems. Thanks Sarah. Great thank you. So I think the poll shows in part how somewhat surprising our results actually are. I'm trying to get my slide back. So what I've highlighted for you there with the red box are the relationships between the mitigation sum, which a higher number means more mitigation actions taken. And then in each column on the table is the dependent variable. So what you can see when we're controlling for the social vulnerability variables in terms of age, race, and income, we're controlling for flood insurance and also for flood depth at each respondent's home. And we found that households who had taken more mitigation had significantly fewer physical health problems, had a significantly lower score on our post-traumatic stress scale, had significantly fewer adverse event experiences. They had less home damage, although those findings were not significant. They had greater near-term recovery, and they also experienced, so if they had higher levels of mitigation, they experienced fewer so some counterintuitive findings, some surprising findings, but the strongly statistically significant findings are more mitigation was associated with less, with fewer physical health problems, fewer adverse event experiences, and greater near-term recovery. Also, I'll talk about those results here in a moment. Oops, wrong. Okay. And also, I think it's worth highlighting the income finding which was another one in which across the board we saw relationships with multiple dependent variables. And these findings go probably in what you would expect, higher income households or higher income, respondents residing in higher income households had 
fewer physical health problems, fewer post-traumatic stress symptoms, fewer adverse event experiences, and greater recovery. So our study shows substantial impacts of Harvey, even though 40% of our respondents did not report any home site damage. We found that about half suffered from allergies, two thirds had some level of post-traumatic stress symptoms. Over 75% had worried about family members or close friends suffering during the disaster. Half had said they'd become closer to family and friends. But the most important part of this analysis is that we found those diffuse benefits of home structure flood hazard mitigation, and that those benefits extended well beyond the expected financial savings due to lesser home damage. These results suggest the hypothesis that protecting the home keeps the occupants safer as the storm approaches, both during and after the storm, and therefore seems to reduce some adverse post-event impacts like poorer health and more challenging experiences. These are different endpoints than the more commonly studied financial savings and repair costs or bumps in home value that can stem from mitigation activities, but they're critically important to post-disaster human well-being and safety. We believe that the home site mitigation actions could theoretically prevent some of the adverse event experiences we assessed in our survey, as the householder would hypothetically be safer in their home during or after an event if they had mitigated against some risks in advance. Engagement in mitigation activities implies that a householder may be less likely to experience unsanitary living conditions and lose access to hot water, for example, if the hot water heater had been elevated. We speculate that the householder would be less likely to report feeling like he or she might be injured or having to perform a dangerous activity or being injured cleaning up since the home site would be safer to begin with and those risks may have been substantially reduced. Being safer to begin with due to home site hazard mitigation could also translate into fewer physical health problems and less post-traumatic stress. We also found that home site mitigation was associated with better, more complete near-term recovery, which was not particularly surprising and definitely aligned with the literature. While I didn't highlight this in the table, we did find that greater pre-event disaster preparedness was significantly associated with more physical health problems. This feels counterintuitive and not at all what we would expect. We, in thinking about this, we think the finding might possibly be related to the fact that householders who felt prepared may have been more complacent which could have led them to experience greater dangers and more physical health problems. The idea of complacency came from the literature that has shown that feeling complacent is associated with being flood insured and has led to reduced damage mitigation actions in other studies. So apart from that one significant finding, the other relationships between pre-event general disaster preparedness and our outcomes were not significant. So we found that the mitigation actions were much more strongly related to the outcomes than were the pre-disaster preparedness measures. In conclusion, we believe that pre-post comparisons like the one we have been engaging in today and in this paper can provide important insights that potentially could improve disaster planning and preparedness. It's tricky though, because although this type of research, if it's not designed from the beginning, is hard to do. So we didn't set the study up as a panel study that was going to follow individuals through time. And so even using and paying for the best marketing research tools available, we were unable to reach the majority of our 2012 survey respondents who qualified for the study. Right? We were unable to reach 74% of them uh, in those weeks following Harvey. And of those that we contacted, 57% did participate, which is quite high, but it reduced our sample to only 71. So while this type of work is important, our study is not a great example of this type of work, right? We did our best, but it really, the, the N is pretty small in terms of our respondents. So while these findings are interesting, we think that more research is needed to see if these benefits of mitigation uh, turn up after other disasters. We do think though that the results and everything else that's known about mitigation means that the public should continue to be made aware of the many benefits to taking home structure mitigation actions beyond just home protection. We hope that non-governmental and governmental actors at all levels, the state, the federal, as well as the local, will continue to promote the importance of home structure mitigation for households at risk to flooding. So this paper, um, 
was accepted by Journal Disaster, so it is available if anyone wants to read it. We'll take questions in a moment, but I also wanted just to say if you were interested in any of our other Hurricane Harvey papers, those that Aaron presented on earlier today, he'd be happy to send you uh, any more information about any of those studies and his email address is there on the slide. So it looks like we have a few minutes uh, and Aaron and I are here if anyone has any questions. So Sarah and Aaron, thank you so much for the presentation. Questions have been coming in throughout, so we'll go ahead and dive right into those. But we just really want to thank you both for the scope of the information you shared. And so if uh, webinar participants have questions, please do use the Q&A or the chat box. And Sarah and Aaron, we're going to go ahead and, and dive in. So the first question that you received was, um, it said this. So given the number of people impacted by Harvey, I would have expected a higher response pool or, or sample size. Just curious, how did you collect the information online, door to door, phone, etc.? Um, and did you only focus on Harris County or did you look at surrounding counties? So can you just say a little bit more about the sample? I know you answered some of that as the presentation progressed, but could you respond to that one first? Yeah, so I'll go ahead and answer that question. So um, the main reason we had the 71 respondents was just the difficulty in um, recontacting those um, respondents from the 2012 survey. And then um, what was the second part of the question again? We basically connected, collected the, the information via a multimodal survey. So we contacted people via their email address and then via their landline if they had it and also via their cell phone. We had funding from the National Science Foundation to conduct this work. And so we had funding to conduct about 450 interviews. And so that's why the sample size isn't any larger. We have that many in some of these papers that are here on the screen. Those findings that Aaron presented for you earlier use the sample of, it turns out to be a little over 400 surveys that were complete or nearly complete. But then as Aaron was just saying with this, pre-post study, we only had the 71 people who we could find and then refind after. Okay, thank you. Another attendee wanted to know, how did mitigation activities practiced by the respondents relate to code or permitting requirements? And so I understand that question would really require that you would have geolocated each one of your respondents and then have some kind of understanding of the the code or permitting requirements in the area where they live so did you um explore that in any in this paper or any of your other papers here we have not Lori, but that does bring me up to the fact that we didn't answer that last part of the other study which was it was not just harris county our respondents live throughout the nine county houston metropolitan statistical area and so I guess that also speaks to this question and that we have not looked into that at all. It's actually a really interesting question in trying to understand why some households have mitigated and some households haven't and what's required and how do you go about doing that. It's a great question. We haven't looked into that at all uh, in this Harvey project. Well, with the wonderful team of students and collaborators you have, I, I feel like that may be a next project to pull those code, <laughs> code requirements. Um, thank you. So another question that came in, wanted to know, I know you mentioned, Sarah, during your part of the presentation that about 40% of your respondents didn't have home damage, I think you said, but one of the, our attendees wanted to know, did you actually know how many of the respondents were were actually flooded, their homes were flooded, and how many were rescued in terms of, I think, leading into that post-traumatic stress most likely that you were measuring? So 65.7% of these respondents that we had pre-post data on were present when major flooding or hurricane damage occurred. Um, and 17% were stranded in an unsafe place or a place where they felt unsafe during the disaster. So it is true the majority of our respondents did not have home damage, as you correctly reported, Laurie, but it was the case that 65, 66% were present when flooding occurred. It's the interesting thing about doing a study like this where you're looking at 
a population-based sample as opposed to studying people at a convention center, at a shelter, people that are receiving assistance, right? So we're getting a sample of people who just happen to live in the greater Houston area and happen to participate in our 2012 survey. And so we're getting some people who have a lot more experience with Harvey-related troubles and then people who have very little. And it, I think it's a strength of our study because we're getting more of a, a random representative sample of people as opposed to just those who are most affected. Thank you. So another question, especially in light of what Erin presented on the front end of the presentation related to potentially socially vulnerable populations, one of our attendees wanted to know what are some of the mitigation strategies that are available for lower income or racial or ethnic minority groups, for example, um, especially in light of the lists you shared, Sarah, during the polls, we know that some of those actions can be rather costly. So again, one of our attendees just wanted to know if you had some options for, again, potentially socially marginalized populations or economically disenfranchised. Um, so that's a really good question. Me and Sarah have had some conversations about how most of our mitigation measures are actually pretty expensive to do. Um, it costs a lot of money to raise a lot of these components above the flood height. And in looking at the list that we have, um, installing the hurricane shutters is probably the cheapest route to go. Um, it may, I don't know how effective it is in terms of the rest of the mitigation measures, um, but we haven't really thought about some of the lower cost um, possible items. Um, that's a good question though. It is, and I think it relates some to the project that our undergrad student, Angel Griego, is working on and what she's finding using the bigger sample of data, right, not just the 71, but the 400, is that while some more socially vulnerable groups were more likely to receive assistance after the hurricane, receiving assistance is not translating into more complete near-term household recovery. And so it suggests that certainly assistance is needed. And our results from this disasters paper on the 71 respondents show that the mitigation can really help. And so it does seem really important as you think about mitigation and recovery and assistance that there are programs in place to really help households be able to do those mitigation actions because they're very expensive and, and labor intensive. So we don't have a better answer for that question beyond the fact that it's a really important question and it's something that we all need to be thinking about. Thank you. Another question. Uh, one of our attendees wanted to know regarding the health related questions that you ask, were those who were um, who reported some of these health effects, were they suffering from contact with mold? And, in, and also, in addition, the same attendee wanted to know uh, how long after Harvey, will you please remind, remind respondents when was the survey deployed after Harvey? So the, the last question, the survey was deployed either three to five months after um, Hurricane Harvey. So respondents could take it um, anywhere from November to December in 2017, and then also um, January of 2018. And then in terms of the physical health problems, for this um, current study, um, we did not use um, mold in this study, but we have used a question about um, is your mold or is your house covered in mold? And then how many square feet of your home is covered in mold after Hurricane Harvey? And in the paper on the health disparities, on the health effects of Harvey, we actually found that variable to be significant, um, not in terms of physical health problems, but in terms of post-traumatic stress. Um, so homes that had more square foot coverage of mold in their home um, had were more likely to have post-traumatic stress, um, which is a very interesting finding. Great, and yeah, because we, with the physical health measure, it's all sorts of different problems summed together, and so that may have been why we didn't find a linkage with mold, because certainly there's a huge literature on mold and respiratory health effects and allergies that you would expect to see for those specific items. Thank you. Another attendee asked whether you could offer some tips and evidence of actions that can improve the sheltering experience for community members who have pre-existing 
mental health challenges um, like PTSD, autism, sensory uh, disorders, and so forth. Yeah, that's a very important question. I know we've seen some literature looking at um, the challenges of providing mental health assistance for people in shelters. After Harvey, there were some studies that came out right away after Harvey looking at that, but I really think that's a, an amazing question and such an important thing to focus on, but I think it's beyond uh, Aaron and my expertise. Thank you, and thanks for to our attendee for asking the question. Uh, Sarah and Aaron, another attendee wanted to know, was very intrigued by your methodological approach. Are there other pre-post disaster event studies like the one that you presented today that, that you're aware of? I know that uh, Jennifer Horney did a study in Houston. They were working in the Manchester community, which is burdened by petrochemical facilities. And so they had been working with that community before Hurricane Harvey. And so they continued their work after Hurricane Harvey and they were measuring the exposure to different petrochemicals in people's homes. And they, they saw what the study showed was that the chemicals had sort of moved around during the flood and resettled in different areas. But I'm not familiar um, with a study like this one, and maybe someone has done it, it definitely is possible. But when we did our literature review, uh, we weren't really finding much on this pre-post besides people saying how important it is to do it, but how difficult it is to have those data. So I think there are some examples, but not a lot of examples. And it's just tricky because you don't know when a disaster is going to strike. So it's hard to get the baseline data and then come back after. But people use surveys that have been you know, randomly done in a community before a disaster, like the National Panel Study of Income Dynamics that's done periodically. And so there are data sets that you can use to go back and look at how things changed after a disaster strikes. But these sort of specific questions about flood mitigation and very like specific to a specific type of hazard that you don't see as often. Mm -hmm. That's right. And for example, I know after Hurricane Katrina, uh, there were there was a sociologist and psychologist who'd been studying African American women in community colleges, and then they uh, were able to follow them after over time after Katrina. And so that's you're absolutely right, Sarah. That we know the places at risk, but sometimes we di we don't know where a disaster is going to happen. So thank you for bringing this important methodological and empirical uh, work to light here. And so to our attendees and to our panelists, we're getting close on time, but what we're going to do here is we know we didn't get to a few of the questions, but Sarah and Erin will receive those in writing and then we'll post their written responses to all the questions. Also, Sarah and Erin, we've already had several requests for your slides as well as for these public, published manuscripts that you shared. And so to everybody on the line, we will definitely be posting the slides, the video from today, and then we'll also work with Sarah and Erin to see which one of the of their publications we can actually share publicly via the website, but we will do that. So to bring this to a close today, uh, first and foremost, Sarah and Erin, on behalf of everybody on the line today, we really want to thank you for sharing your knowledge and expertise. And you have um, done so much important work before Hurricane Harvey and also all of the papers that you've been producing have really shed so much light on preparedness and the importance of mitigation. So thank you for this. We also want to thank FEMA and the National Science Foundation for making this webinar series possible and much gratitude for all of you for joining us today. Before we close, we have a couple of brief announcements as we always do. And so one, if you are planning on receiving credit for attending this webinar, please contact Katie Murphy at katherine.murphy-1 at colorado.edu to receive your certificate of attendance. Her information is also, of course, up on our Hazard Center website. And you can learn more there about how to get your certificate and apply this to your emergency management certification. 
Second, thanks to the generous support of FEMA and the National Science Foundation, we have now released the call for our second round of funding for our newly established Mitigation Matters Small Research Grant Program. And you can find more about that on our website as well. And please note that the application deadline for the spring round of proposals is March 16th, 2020. So please keep this in mind. And then finally, we will look forward to welcoming you all back here to the webinar series next month. Please save Tuesday, March 10th from 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern on your calendars. February is Earthquake Awareness Month. And in March, we will have the chance to learn from Bad Bradley Bartholomew from the Utah Division of Emergency Management and Sean McGowan from FEMA Region 8. They're going to be presenting on the Fix the Bricks program and other work around the Wasatch Fault and highlighting best building practices from Utah's earthquake mitigation efforts, which are absolutely vital. You can find more information about the March webinar and other webinars coming up in the series, as well as information from our past webinars at hazards.colorado.edu. Again, thank you to Sarah and Erin for the informative presentation today and to all of you for joining us. On behalf of the entire team here at the Natural Hazard Center, we hope to see you again next month. Please take care of yourself and others.